I was off duty. I was working my side job. Uh, was a body and fender. I had a shop in Staten Island. So I was uh, working on the cars, and uh, first I get a delivery. The first guy comes in and says, uh, he goes, you see a plane hit the World Trade Center? So I'm on the Staten Island side of the Gothels Bridge, right across is Linden Airport, just making an assumption that it was, you know, a little small Cessna or somebody, you know. And then about a half hour later, I got a second delivery, and the guy's like, did you see? So I'm like, from the position of the shop, I couldn't see, but short ride down to the water, and I seen the black plume. I'm like, that's so, make a couple phone calls. I uh, hear uh, FDNY has a total recall, which I think there's only been a couple in the history of the department where they called all F off duty members to come back in. I had gotten promoted a year before to lieutenant and then sent to the academy as an instructor. So I happened to have my turnout gear with me because on the weekends we had the opportunity to work overtime in the field. So we drove to uh, Rescue 5 in uh, and Division 8 is down in uh, the northern part of Staten Island and they had buses there where they were loading guys up on the bus. You would sign, they had everybody sign a journal, that's why they had some kind of record of who was there and then we took the ferry across. As we were coming across, uh, the second tower came down on us. So there was a priest on the ferry who was giving general absolution to people, which you know was a little uh, unnerving. I mean, first time in my life that that ever happened. Um, unfortunately, a few guys that I went over with um, subsequently passed later on from World Trade Center related sickness. So I remember when the priest is giving general absolution, I, I go, Father, Billy wants to know if we make it out of this, you know, is this good forever? We're good, you know, we, we're covered, you know what I mean? So just a little humor to try and lighten things up. But. So as we, you know, we landed, uh, you know, the ferry docked and uh, was basically, everything was covered with ash, you know, it looked like snow. We made our way up to uh, the World Trade Center. There was, uh, there was a couple of chiefs that were trying to uh, organized, you know, a plan of attack. They were trying to, if you were assigned to an engine company, you were lining up here, you were assigned to a truck company over here, and then they were gonna begin attack. But, you know, they were trying to do what they could do. Guys were waiting online, and then after a while, guys got a little impatient, and guys kind of broke off to do whatever they could do. You know what I mean? I, I remember meeting up with some guys from my old firehouse, and, you know, we had made our way over by the Deutsche Bank. You were trying to, Put whatever fire you could go out or assist anybody, you know, anything that you could do. Uh, unfortunately, when the towers crashed, I think it uh, damaged the infrastructure of the water. They didn't have proper water pressure coming from the hydrant. So eventually what they had to do is they had the marine units draft water from the Hudson River and then supply companies, which, you know, took some time. It was, uh, you know, it was the day, you know, normally, you know, we have a standard plan of attack when we pull up at an ordinary, ordinary fire or, you know, and you know what you're doing. So here it was, just, you know, you're just trying to do whatever you can do, you know, assist whatever people could be assisted. Unfortunately, I know they set up a lot of triage centers. They expected a lot of injured. There wasn't that many injured. You know, most people were, uh, you know, were killed. So, um, you know, it was... Uh, a difficult day. I mean, uh, most guys knew, nobody knew what the head count was, but you just had to assume the amount of people that were up in that building that, you know, that we, there was a, you know, a serious loss to the FDNY that day. So we spent the first couple months, like everyone, like, every, you know, pretty much everyone, uh, you know, all first responders, and uh, we were up there digging. You know, we had, there was a lot of fathers that lost sons, so there was a group um, from the firehouse that I'm from you know, even when you weren't assigned up there to dig, you know, guys were on their own time or would go to be with the fathers, you know, to comfort them, to help them, to assist them. And then uh, had gotten a call from the chief of the fire academy saying that uh, we need to meet. And I'm like, all right. So we, we go up to see him and uh, the ceremony unit prior to that only consisted of a few members and that they needed to, you know, start putting together funerals. So um, we asked them, okay, <laughs> you have a book? You have something that you could, uh, and they're like, uh, nah, you'll, you'll figure it out. So 
One of the first funerals we did was uh, Alan Feinberg was in Marlboro, New Jersey. You know, um, never did a funeral before. Now we have a Jewish member, which is going to be slightly different. And we just kind of, uh, kind of winged it, you know what I mean? And uh, a lot of trial and error. Each time, you know, just like anything else, you get better and better. And so one of the good things that came out of a tragedy is we've really become too good at this, you know what I mean? Uh, and we've been around to other departments to assist them because, you know, other departments will have, haven't had a line of duty in, you know, one line of duty death in a hundred years. And now here we had the opportunity to come in and help them out. All the little attention to detail, I truly yeah. believe that that helps the family heal afterwards. Maybe not, you know, right away, but, you know, all the little details that they start to remember that helps, you know, collectively we take the worst day of their life and just make it a little bit better. People that volunteer to come be a part of the ceremony are mostly the workers, you know what I mean? Like, not everybody works at the same, but if they, they come to be a part of this, in every firehouse, EMS station, there's those certain members that go above and beyond. And those members tend to gravitate towards us, you know what I mean? So, like you say, there's, uh, there's no I in team. You know, without one, you know, as John would say, somebody's got to be the big toe, but uh, without all the little, de you know, all the people stepping forward, you know, from over here, just loading trucks two, three days before a funeral, there's guys over here loading trucks with the equipment, you know what I mean? It's almost like, you know, the roadies, you know, when you, the rock star gets all the credit, but without the staff and everybody backing them, it's not, it's not gonna happen, it's not possible. As we say, you know what I mean, uh, the mantra of the fire department or the promise that we make to our families is to never forget. And, you know, some places or some people have truly forgotten um, or believe that it could never happen again. Well, as we know, we think, God forbid it ever happens again, but, you know, it's possible. But the main thing is you can never forget. Like, uh, there's been times where, the, you know, different people say, well, why, why do they read the names every year? And you know, we have friends, you know, we, we all lost a lot of friends, but we have a couple guys that work within our unit or family assistance unit that lost their brother. And just asking them, they said, it means the world that once a year, at least once a year, my brother's name is read aloud. You know, because some people say, well, all the names are on the memorial, you know what I mean? Why does it need to be, it needs to be read aloud. You know what I mean? Just these things, they can't be forgotten. You know what I mean? They, forever and ever, one of the traditions in the fire department is we put a bronze plaque when a person dies. On the one year anniversary, we have a ceremony where we dedicate the bronze plaque. But that plaque goes on a wall in a firehouse or an EMS station to basically, that member's name is gonna live forever. The tradition is the senior people there, when the junior person comes in, explains, you know, what happened to each individual, you know, what that plaque, and then 25 years later, when that junior person is now the senior person, it continues and the same thing and explains. So that perpetuates, you know, that member's name again, helping us to, with that promise to never forget.